All right. Today is Wednesday, January 26th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Where do we start? Yet another roller coaster ride in the stock market. The Dow Jones at the highs of the day was up over 300 points and finished the day in the red. And the reason is the press conference by Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. And what a disaster that was. You see, this country is in an economic crisis. The likes that we have never seen before, at least since the 1970s. And this disaster is inflation. And inflation was born due to the incompetency of the Federal Reserve led by Jerome Powell. In such times, we need strong reliable confident leadership and most importantly leadership with a plan regardless of the circumstances and the scenarios unfortunately this is not what we have in jerome powell you saw him in display today dazed confused a man without a plan unprepared stumbling mumbling all over the place to the point where I actually felt bad for the guy i even called him a senile on twitter today because he kept forgetting the questions he was unprepared, he was a nerve wreck, and when the market senses weak leadership, you see the reaction that we got today in the market, reversing all of the gains. Make no mistake, this inflation is getting out of control, and the Fed is way behind the curve. Jerome Powell should have came today decisive that the Fed will do whatever it takes right now, today, be it raising interest rates, be it normalizing the balance sheet, be it tapering the assets purchasing programs, Yet he should have also came out with a plan for different scenarios in the market in this economy. For example, what is the Fed's plan if inflation goes down for the wrong reason on its own? For example, an exhaustion of demand in the economy or dramatic slowdown in the economy. What would the Fed's plans be if we have another variant of the virus impacting the economy? What would the Fed's plans be, let's say, if the yield curve inverts? He did not have answers to any of that. He was once again dazed, confused, stumbling, mumbling, not sure what to say. A man with no plan, with no decisive hand on the steering wheel. And he's going to drive this economy and this market off a cliff. Take, for example, this question. It was clear. What would the Fed's plan be, say, if the yield curve inverts? How would the Federal Reserve adjust the monetary policy and the tightening? If that happens, and listen to Jerome Powell and the answer he gave. Um, Chair Powell, some investors are expecting the yield curve could flatten or even invert after rate hikes begin. Um, would that worry you? And how important is that risk in the Fed's consideration for adjusting policy? So um, we we do monitor the the slope of the yield curve, but we don't control the slope of the yield curve. Um, Many, flac many factors uh, influence longer term interest rates. But it is something that we watch, and, and you will know that from uh, when we had this issue a few years ago. Um, and we take it into account, uh, along with many other financial conditions, as we try to assess the implications of all those conditions for the economic outlook. So that's, that's one thing I would say. Another is currently you've got. Uh, a slope, if you think about twos to tens, two, two-year treasury to ten-year treasury, I think that's around 75 basis points. That's well within the range of a normal, of a normal yield curve slope. Um, so it's something we're monitoring. Uh, it, we don't think of it as, I don't think of it as some kind of an iron law, but we do look at it and try to understand the implications and what it's telling us. And it's, but it's one of many things that we monitor. Again, generic answers, vague, no clarity at all. We will monitor, we will see, we'll continue to assess. Nothing decisive, no framework, no plan at all. And this has been the doctrine of Jerome Powell from the get-go, being vague and having no plan at all. After all, this is the man who said that we're not going to use a formula to adjust and anchor inflation expectations. We're just going to eyeball inflation at 2%. We now know that this decision was a disaster. How could the Fed move inflation expectations higher to so-called recover the economy without having a formula? And now he doesn't even have a plan if the yield curve inverts. We will monitor, we will see, we will assess, we will talk about, and this is exactly what the market doesn't like and this is exactly what the economy doesn't like. We need decisive leadership with a plan for the different scenarios and the different outcomes. Jerome Powell, also today in the press conference, admitted 
that the supply chain crisis is much worse than anybody has expected. And of course, this throws out, once and for all, they put it to rest, the bullshit transitory argument that the Federal Reserve, led by Jerome Powell, has been beating the drum on over and over and over again, that inflation is transitory, transitory, transitory. But now he admits the supply chain crisis is much worse than we've been told, specifically when it comes to chips. Take a listen. Um, uh, as a follow to that, you testified that the supply chain issues could be worked out by the end of the year. You talked about that uh, today. The CEO of Ford, though, told Fox Business today that the chip shortage will last into 2023. So today you said inflation will start to ease this year. I want to drill down and get a timeline that you see as to when we could see that relief. Thank you. So I, I would not say that I would expect the supply chain issues to be completely worked out by the end of this year. I do not expect them, and I have not expected them. Uh, what I would say, and I have been saying, is that I expect progress to be made uh, in the second half of this year, mainly. Progress, because we're, we're not making much progress. If you look at a ton of metrics, you can find some that suggest that delivery times are shorter and inventories in some industries moving up. But overall, we're not, we're not making progress. And, you know, things like the semiconductor issue, are gonna, they're going to be uh, quite a long time. I would think they'll go more than through to, uh, 2023. Um, and then came the question about the Fed's insider trading scandal, specifically Dallas Fed President Bob Kaplan, the criminal that he is. The reporter asked the question, can you please provide us with the dates of Mr. Kaplan's transactions? Listen to Jerome Powell's answer, or perhaps lack thereof. Chair Powell, uh, Chair Powell uh, good afternoon, Michelle and Chair Powell, Craig Torres from Bloomberg. Um, Chair Powell, at the beginning of the conversation, you said risks are two-sided. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what are the risks to the elusive soft landing? Is Fed policy a risk over tightening or what are the risks? And then second, Chair Powell, I have a quick administrative question. Um, you know, uh, Robert Kaplan's disclosure of his securities transactions. In, in a couple months, Chair Powell, or maybe sooner, you and I will file our tax returns and we'll list transactions and all kinds of things. And next to those transactions, we'll put dates. And Bloomberg asked for the dates of Mr. Kaplan's transactions. The Dallas Fed is not giving us the dates. And I don't see why this is a matter for the um, uh, inspector general or anybody else. I mean, why can't he give us the dates? Will you help us get the dates of those transactions? Thanks. So, um, you asked about the risks first. So, I, you know, the... And listen to Pal. He's like, let me take the easy one first. And perhaps by the end of my bullshit answer, maybe everybody's going to forget about your hard part, the question. I know you've been all over this issue with uh, with my colleagues, Craig, on, on the issue of, of information. We don't we don't have that information at the board. And, uh, you know, I, hand, I asked the inspector general to do an investigation. And uh, that is out of my hands. I am playing no role in it. I seek to play no role in it. And um, I, I don't, I, I really, I can't help you here today on this, on this issue. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Again, no answers. I don't know. Maybe this, maybe that. Vague, confused, all over the place. A lack of decisive leadership. This is the problem with the Federal Reserve. We don't have somebody with a steady hand, with strong conviction of what they're doing with a plan, with a clear roadmap. Every time Jerome Powell speaks, we have to guess what he's gonna say. And he might think that this is cool, being mysterious and all, yet when it comes to this magnitude of the economic crisis that we have right now, we're not looking for vague, we're certainly not looking for a mystery man here, we're looking for clear, decisive leadership. And Mr. Powell could not be any further than that. Next, let's talk about this market, because we have reached extreme oversold conditions, specifically in the NASDAQ, but for now, the technicals are supporting an upcoming rebound rally. All what the market needs is a small tailwind, a sustainable tailwind. And this will force short covering, profit taking, and it will bid the market higher in a rebound relief rally. Heading into the day, it appeared that we had that tailwind coming out of Microsoft. Yesterday, Microsoft reported earnings and the name was down big, over 5%, even though the earnings came out pristine. And the reason is, as I've told you before in this program, we have expectations of peak earnings, meaning the earnings that we're about to get right now and some we got in certain companies, these earnings are the peak. And from this point on, everything is going to go downhill. 
because as we've talked before, the consumer is running out of spending reserves. They exhausted their stimmies, they exhausted their savings, and now they're swapping those credit cards up and down, up and down like crazy. What happens after that? We have a massive inflation problem causing labor shortages, causing stagnation in the economy. You combine it all together and we have a stagflation phenomenon in this economy. You see, in the beginning stages of inflation, it's good. All in all, consumers flushed with cash, companies can jack prices higher, and it all works out beautifully. And then reality hits, inflation gets out of control, and there is a limit to how much companies can hike prices. And at some point, they're going to have to eat losses in their margins. Their margins have to shrink because to continuously raise prices will result in reduced market shares. That's number one. Number two, corporate revenues and earnings got a massive boost in 2020 and 2021 due to the stimulus and the trillions and trillions of dollars of so-called accommodation from the Fed to corporations to the market and the economy. It is pretty much impossible to match these numbers. The consumer doesn't have the same spending power as the Fed. So what we saw in 2020 and 2021 is peak earnings. It will be impossible to match these numbers from this point on. Yet Microsoft, in the conference call, came out and gave, and pay attention to this, a boosted outlook in their guidance, meaning they assured investors that this is not the peak. As a matter of fact, sales will accelerate from this point on. I disagree with that. I think they did that on purpose to save the stock after hours. And it did the magic. It did the trick. It doesn't matter for now whether they're lying or not, because you got to keep in mind they're spending $70 billion on acquiring one company alone, Activision Blizzard, which is a disaster deal given the price tag. And I think the executives in Microsoft dug their grave because in the next earnings report, it will be pretty much impossible to live up to the expectations that they just gave, specifically when we're looking at the indicators and we see an economy that is slowing down dramatically. But regardless, the upbeat guidance by Microsoft did the trick, and you saw the Nasdaq blasting higher today in the morning until Jerome Powell started speaking. Then the market made a U-turn to the downside. Now, that doesn't change anything for now when it comes to the technicals and the mechanics of the market. The market remains extremely oversold, specifically when it comes to the Nasdaq. Now, we're not going to see or hear from Jerome Powell until March. So that opens a window for the market to move higher without Jerome Powell ruining any relief rally we can get from this point on. The window is still here for any catalyst for any tailwind to push this market higher. And this tailwind will come from corporate earnings. What did we have today after hours? Intel. Intel bombed. That's a no-go. And then came Tesla, which reported decent earnings, by the way. The problem is the market is not going to care. The market will assume this report is the peak and everything is going to go downhill from this point on. And therefore, the stock was down by almost 5%. And then came Elon Musk on the wire to calm things down. And indeed, he pushed the stock all the way to the flat line at least the last time I checked. And then we heard the news from Bill Ackman. Bill Ackman bought a massive stake in Netflix. He bought the dip. So we have two tailwinds right now. Tesla not sinking and we have Netflix moving higher after hours on the news that Bill Ackman bought the dip. For now, this could be enough to form the tailwind that the Nasdaq needs to initiate the relief rally, at least for a few days, if not weeks, before the market turns sour again, because the main problem that we have, inflation and a hawkish Fed, will not go away. Yet the last obstacle for this market to initiate the relief rally is earnings from Apple, which we're about to get after the bell tomorrow. And if Apple delivers, once again, we're not going to pay attention at all to the earnings from last quarter, unless there is a massive bomb there, for example, the Chinese consumer turning against Apple and not consuming their products anymore. That would be a massive bomb that will crush any relief rally in the Nasdaq. Absent of that, if the management and Apple give out an upbeat guidance, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, but if they do that, then you're going to see a lot of short covering on Friday, pushing the Nasdaq to initiate this relief rally. Now, now, let's shift to the subject du jour of this video, and here it is, in focus tonight. The chip crisis, oh boy, it's getting worse, and we are now reaching red alert, alarming levels in the chip shortage in this country. Today, the Commerce Secretary came out and admitted that the U.S. is reaching crisis level when it comes to the chip shortage. Matter of fact, American firms have few days before they run out of supply of semiconductors. American companies have an average of less than five days worth of semiconductors on hand, a level leaving them vulnerable 
to the production shutdowns if supply is disrupted, the Commerce Department said Tuesday. The findings from a survey of more than 150 firms last September underscore the precarious nature U.S. companies face amid a global shortage of the crucial computer chips, which has already forced some businesses to slash production and contributed to an ongoing spike in inflation. The Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimundo, said the semiconductor supply chain remains fragile, and it is essential that Congress passes chip funding as soon as possible, of course. Every problem, money was solved, right? More abuse of taxpayer money will solve the problem. Anyhow, she added, with skyrocketing demand, pay attention now for all of you who say that this inflation is due to the supply or the virus shut down supply and this is why we're having an inflation problem wrong we're having an inflation problem because the fed initiated trillions and trillions of dollars of fake money printed out of thin air aka the cocaine and fueled unprecedented level of demand that is pretty much impossible for the supply chain to cope with virus or no virus we have an out of whack demand problem that is causing this inflation look no further than rents, for example. Did COVID kill all of the supply of rents of apartments in the country? Of course not. What we're seeing is an insane, absurd level of demand that is pretty much impossible for any supply chain to cope with. Continuing, with skyrocketing demand and full utilization of existing manufacturing facilities, it is clear the only solution to solve this crisis in the long term is to rebuild our domestic manufacturing capabilities. And this is according to the Commerce Secretary the delusional Commerce Secretary. The survey found chip demand is currently 20% higher than its level in 2019, and companies expect more orders than supply for another six months. Da -da -da -da. And here it is from Fortune magazine. Chip Armageddon reveals how terrifyingly fragile the U.S. supply chain actually is. A new report from the Department of Commerce released Tuesday found that the typical inventory of semiconductors chips fell from 40 days in 2019 to less than 5 days in 2021. Some key industries were specifically strapped. That had a big impact, particularly for automakers, consumer electronics, LED lights, and even wind turbine producers. The global auto industry, for example, lost about $210 billion in revenues in 2021 thanks to the global chip shortage that forced companies to scale back production. And again, we must ask the question, why do we have a chip shortage that forced the scale back in production? The answer is the out-of-whack demand. What is causing the out-of-whack demand? The answer is the cocaine from the Federal Reserve. Continuing, what's more? The chip shortage also drove up inflation because both new and used cars got so expensive as automakers need chips to make new vehicles. The price for new cars and trucks in December was up a shocking 11.8% year over year. Once again, the Commerce Department said, quoting now, that means if a thing outbreak a natural disaster or political instability disrupts a foreign semiconductor facility for even just a few weeks, it has the potential to shut down a manufacturing facility in the U.S., putting American workers and their families at risk. Now, listen to the solution, by the way, from the delusional Commerce Secretary. The continued vulnerability of the semiconductor sector and the related supply chain has Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo calling for Congress to pass the CHIPS for America Act. And I'm pretty sure in the Chips for America Act, we're throwing a bunch of yayo to the donor class, the billionaires, the Smithsonian Museum, Brookings Institution, and the rest of the satanic cult. But anyhow, the legislation which the Senate passed in the summer would provide $52 billion in subsidies to help semiconductor companies to build production facilities in the U.S. Or oh, the poor semiconductor companies, they need the taxpayer to subsidize them, right? Raimondo is not alone the Biden administration has backed the bill and last month, nearly 60 CEOs for major corporations including Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Toyota, Verizon sent an open letter urging the U.S. House of Representatives to pass the CHIPS Act. The criminals said the chip shortage poses risk to our entire economy and time is of the essence. Oh really? You see, in Washington DC right now, they're fighting and blocking every single bill that gives the poor much needed aid in this inflation, be it in childcare, be it in food, utilities, or gas bills. They're blocking all of these efforts 
saying that it is not fiscally responsible, it's going to push inflation higher, and we're not a socialist country, this is capitalism, yada, yada, yada. But somehow, socialism for corporations, that's okay. That's part of capitalism, right? When we abuse taxpayer money and funnel all of that money in subsidies to chips manufacturing companies. And by the way, are these companies really starving? Do they need the subsidies? And the aid from the taxpayer? Of course not. Look at the market caps of various companies in the semiconductor industry. NVIDIA, $570 billion in market cap. Texas Instruments, $165 billion. Xilinx, $43 billion. Applied Materials, $120 billion. Qualcomm, $188 billion. AMD, $134 billion. Intel, $210 billion. Broadcom, $230 billion. LAM Research, $84 billion. These companies combined have a market cap that exceeds $1 trillion. Yet they're starving. They need the taxpayer to float them to build the manufacturing facilities here. What a load of shit. A clear abuse of taxpayer money. Currently, U.S. manufacturers only produce about 12% of the world's semiconductors, according to the White House. However, that might change if companies follow Intel's lead. The tech giant announced last week it planned to spend $20 billion to build chip-making facilities in Ohio. Intel expects the new Albany plants to be operational in 2025. Two points here. Number one, all of a sudden Intel has a spare $20 billion to spend, but they need $50 billion from the taxpayer. Number two, the facility will not be operational till 2025. We need immediate action right now to tackle the inflation crisis. And therefore, all of you have been saying all along, this is a supply problem. All we need is to ramp up the supply and inflation will go away. Maybe by 2025, if you want to wait and see what hyperinflation looks like, or perhaps stagflation, by the time these facilities are operational, we're going to have a market that is oversupplied and the demand is down because hyperinflation or stagflation destroys the economy from the bottom up. By the time these supplies reach the market, the demand will be nowhere to be found. Another disaster. And therefore, this channel has been saying all along, this inflation problem is a demand problem. We need to tame down the demand. You can only do that by adjusting the monetary policy, aka tightening, by raising interest rates higher. Yes? Raising interest rates higher is destructive. It's going to crash the stock market, perhaps the real estate market too. But this is what happens when you have an incompetent, naive madman at the helm of the Federal Reserve. Continuing, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger said Friday that the company's decision to move forward with the Ohio factory was motivated by the CHIP Act. So they're still looking for a handout. Quoting now, he says, Now Congress needs to finish the job. End quote. Let's hear from Pat Gilzinger himself. With or without the CHIPS Act, we think we still have some rough road in front of us. And I've said, you know, we believe the chip shortage is at its worst right now. It will get incrementally better as we go through 22, but we expect the shortage to persist into 23. If the CHIPS Act doesn't pass, if the European Act doesn't pass, you know, we think the slope of the recovery dampens. You know, if, if it passes, I'm announcing our next fab. Shovels go into ground more rapidly if this gets put into place. So let's get it done. Yeah, let's get it done. Come on, taxpayer. Come on, man. Give us some money. And I bet the majority of the money is going to go in executive bonuses, and handouts, share buybacks. These companies are holding the taxpayer hostage. You want inflation to go away? Give us about $54 billion and that'll do the trick. Meanwhile, they're spending billions and billions of dollars in share buybacks, buying their stock back to prop the equity prices higher for these stocks and these companies so the executives can dump at a higher price, cashing millions of if not billions of dollars. And then who cares what happens to the stock and the retail investors holding the bag in these stocks? This is a broken criminal system, folks. Continuing, the legislation is not without its critics. However, in November, Senator Bernie Sanders contended that the legislation was akin to rewarding bad behavior, saying in a floor speech that the chipmakers have the wherewithal to build the necessary facilities. And we know that Senator Bernie Sanders is spineless. He barks, 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 and then he does nothing anyways. He goes on with the program, with the boys, whatever they want, the corporate club that we call the Democratic and Republican parties. And once again, when we look at the chips manufacturing industry, the revenues at all time highs, the year over year change in revenues for these semiconductor companies is over 30%. They're making a shitload of money, but they need to be subsidized. 
to build facilities here in the United States to manufacture chips, give me a break. And another, shall we say, caveat in all of this is the geopolitical tensions between China and Taiwan. Taiwan, their only moat is their chip manufacturing industry. If we we're about to move the chip manufacturing industry from Taiwan to the United States, then Taiwan loses its moat. Matter of fact, the CIA calls it the Silicon Shield, which has been protecting Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. You think Xi Jinping is not watching all of this? Once the semiconductor manufacturing moves from Taiwan to the US and Taiwan becomes less important for the global economy, you think Xi Jinping is not going to invade Taiwan once it becomes less important and less critical to the global economy? Think again. Anyhow, let's move on to cover the market information today. We start with the performance of the market, and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average is down by 129.64 points, or a decline of 0.38%. The Nasdaq, pretty much in the flat line despite the declines from the highs, closing in the green by 2.82 points, or pretty much on the flat line. The S&P 500, also on the flat line, down by 6.52 points, or a decline of 0.15%. And what about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal, energy. Number two for the silver, technology. Number three for the bronze, financials. On the other hand, the decliners of the day led by REITs, industrials, and defensives. And what about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 27% advancing versus 70% declining. The NASDAQ, 30% advancing versus 65% declining once again when we see these exaggerated ratios to the downside you're gonna get a pop at least in the pre-market overnight moving on to commodities futures what's going on here energy futures propping higher oil be it the wti or brent gaining over one and a half percent apiece today once again inflation is transitory my ass crude oil prices continue to move higher and they will reach 100 by the summer if not sooner likewise gasoline prices and heating oil prices were up and this time around they were not alone they were joined by natural gas prices closing with gains of a little over two percent although natural gas was up by the tune of over six percent today so well off the highs but still closing in the green and stick around when we cover the news about natural gas what about softs the decline in lumber continues and we have news for you stick around we also have sugar not sweet today down by about one and a half percent yet we have muted activities for cocoa and coffee while cotton and oj blasting higher oj gaining almost four percent today alone metals massive declines for gold and silver today really disappointing and the majority of the declines happened right after the fomc announcement and the conference by Jerome Powell. Gold down almost 2%, silver, similar story. On the other hand, copper closing pretty much on the flat line, while we have modest gains for platinum, almost half a percentage point today. And look at this, the gains in palladium continue to rack. Massive gains today of almost 6% in palladium futures. The tensions between Russia and Ukraine, Russia is one of the largest producers of palladium in the world, and the tensions are pushing palladium prices higher. We've seen a phenomenon last year when palladium prices were trading much higher, and this phenomenon is the theft of catalytic converters. You wake up in the morning, you place the key in the fob, you turn it on, and all of a sudden your car sounds like a sports car. Don't get too excited here somebody stole your catalytic converter what about meats we're seeing gains for both live and feeder cattle futures while lean hogs losing some ground here by one percent what about grains we're seeing massive gains in soybeans we covered soybeans not so long ago i'm going to cover more for you in a minute up across the board more than two percent gains a piece for soybeans soybean meal and soybean oil we also have modest gains for corn rough rice oats while canola pretty much on the flat line on the other hand we is losing ground down by over three percent today and here are some commodities news for you we start with natural gas today temperatures drop to dangerous levels in wisconsin we're talking about minus 35 matter of fact today we had dangerous wind chill in both the east and the west of the mississippi river it was a rough morning today in wisconsin for sure and this pushed natural gas prices higher you add the tensions between russia and ukraine and you have some tailwinds here for natural gas prices to continue to move higher what about lumber by the way why are we seeing lumber pulling back here the answer is 
Home builders are pausing home construction due to the elevated prices of lumber. The problem is, it is still elevated and the demand for housing remains sky high. The market is severely undersupplied. They can play these games for only so long before they have to bow down and buy lumber at higher prices. And this is reflected, by the way, in new home prices. They're surging out of whack, pricing the majority of families out of the market. And then we have meats. And here's a stunning revelation, by the way. You know when you buy meat and it says product of USA? It's not really a product of the USA. And the tragic part of meat inflation, which is stunning, by the way, meat prices are skyrocketing. And as you can see, retail prices for a pound of beef are surging out of whack. The highest prices we've seen in decades. But what is the share of U.S. farmers from all of this? The answer is their share is actually going down. Why are we seeing this phenomenon? Here it is. Hamburger or steak marked product of the USA may contain beef from cattle as far away as Australia. A loose labeling practice that has grabbed President Joe Biden's attention. Oh, he has attention now? As he and the antitrust regulators set their sight on giant meat packing conglomerates. Once again, it's not the Fed's reckless policy pushing meat inflation higher. It's the consolidation of the industry. I have news for you. The meat industry in this country has been consolidated within about four to five meat packers for decades now. Another one. What about grains prices? The headline reads, Farmers hoard crops as dry Brazil. Weather keeps prices elevated. You have a problem here in Brazil with the weather phenomenons. As you can see, the U.S. soybean production is down from the prior year, but it remains elevated above the five-year average. We have a similar story with corn. The problem comes from the Brazilian production. The Brazilian production of soybeans is down year over year, and it is below the five-year average. And the same goes for Brazilian corn and Argentinian soy. What does that mean? We have a severe undersupply problem in soy and corn. China, the demand from China remains sky high. They're hoarding soybeans and corn. If the supply is nowhere to be found, then soybean prices will shoot up higher. And you're seeing this happening today, gaining 2% apiece, be it soybeans, soybean meal, soybean oil, unbelievable rally here. They're going to continue to buy the dip in soybean futures over and over and over again, because it's not just the reckless monetary policy pushing inflation higher. Combine this with the virus, the supply chain problems, and on top of that, the weather crisis destroying crops across the globe. Folks, once again, if you think this inflation is gone or it's going to be transitory or about to see the peak, think again. We're about to head into an inflation super cycle that could last for decades. And I'm not the only one predicting that, by the way. Even Jeremy Grantham came out yesterday with another dire prediction about inflation. We'll share that in another video. But here it is. Harvest estimates for Brazilian crops have been declining, dashing hopes for supply recovery and relief from food inflation. Farmers in the South American nation have sold 19% of corn they expect to gather in the coming months, down from the five-year average of 29%. And this is according to ADM. Good stock, by the way. We'll talk in the heat map analysis. Continuing, recent rains should help limit crop losses in both Brazil and Argentina. The chief executive officer, Juan Luciano, told investors dry weather in southern Brazil has cut yield potential while wetter conditions in the north could stall soybean harvesting and delay planting of the second crop of corn. The CEO said a lot of people are looking at the South American weather. He also added South American weather is very strange at the moment. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume remains suppressed. Not a good sign for the bulls here. Yet the hottest table by far is Apple, with about 1 million contracts traded today. About 61% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 600,000 contracts, about 57% of those were calls. And at number three, AT&T, what a disaster that was, with almost half a million contracts traded today, about 63.5% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the casino today. We start with the ticker XLE, the energy ETF. They continue to buy upside calls, in this case, the 74 calls, the expiration date, March 18th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 13 and a half percent by then they paid about 75 cents a piece to enter the trade all in all spending about 1.2 million dollars and what about the trade for the ticker lazr luminar 
One of my favorite names as a company, not a stock. The CEO bought some shares, and this is encouraging so far because Mercedes also bought stake in Luminar. So somebody's buying upside calls here, the 16 bucks calls for the expiration date, February 4th, with expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 18.5% by then. They paid about 35 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $380,000. And what about the ticker AFRM, a firm? Buy now, pay later, or never. Yet the stock is down big, way oversold. And hence, any rebound rally we're about to get in the market will be led by names like a firm. In this case, they're buying upside calls, the 63 calls for the expiration date, February 11th, with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 13% by then. They paid about four bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about four and a half million dollars. And this one is interesting. The trade for the ticker UVXY, a proxy for the VIX. Somebody's fading the pop in the VIX, and I think they will be right. In this case, buying the 15 bucks puts for the expiration date January 28th, meaning this Friday, with the expectations that the UVXY will drop down by more than 18.5% by then. They paid about 20 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $150,000. What about the ticker XLNX Xilinx? The buying puts here, the 135 puts for the expiration date March 18th, with the expectations that the name will crash by more than 23% by then. They paid about five bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about four million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? They continue to buy puts here, the 390 puts for the expiration date February 14th, with the expectations that the SPY will drop down by more than 10% by then. They paid about two bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter the trade. all in all spending about 1.7 million dollars and lastly at the bottom of the table what about the ticker uber uber they're buying the 37 calls for the expiration date february 18th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than six percent by then they paid about one buck and 70 cents a piece to enter the trade. all in all spending about 1.2 million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis once again the theme is mixed the market was up all in all, but it pulled back after the conference from Jerome Powell. The majority of the pullback came from the high beta, high multiple names, the software names, the communication services name, the IPO names, the high multiple names, Kathy Wood, kind of names, Twilio, Snap, Zoom, Ruko, Peloton, all down. We have some notable movers here. Let's talk about AT&T down big, over 8% today. Even though the revenue and the growth from HBO Max is impressive, my suggestion is separate the high growth part of the business, HBO, from the dying part of the business, AT&T, be it cable or phones. The drop in AT&T was contagious. It dropped down names like Viacom and Discovery. Discovery was down big, over 9% today. Likewise, Roku, Comcast, Disney, Netflix, all down in sympathy with the drop in AT&T. Another notable decliner is ADP in industrials, down big, almost 9% today. Likewise, Boeing, down big, almost 5% today. We're seeing drops in names Names like Generac, over 4% losses today. Yet the defense contractors, in this case Lockheed Martin LMT, continues to hold within industrials. We're also seeing the residential names, Lennar, DR Horton, dropping big as the 10 year yield moves higher. Now, as I shared with you before, these home builders are halting their projects due to the rise in lumber prices. We also saw DraftKings moving higher today. It is an oversold name. We have some good news about more legalizations of online gambling in the country. Another name that bucked the trend today moving higher is the ticker ADM for Archer Daniels, a name that I own in my portfolio a name that I pitched to you before. Why? Because in this inflationary environment, what's going to work is oil and food. Oil, you got ExxonMobil, you got the ETFs, you got oil futures. That's going to work until the crash happens. But the outperformance of food will continue to be with us before and after the crash. And in this case, ADM is one of the top names that benefit from the rising inflation in food prices. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs, we're seeing chips outperforming today. Interesting, usually rebounds in the tech sector are led by chips. The rebounds start by chips moving higher and then little by little, the big caps, the software names will also pick up and move higher. But again, we need a consistent catalyst. 
that is sustainable. It was Microsoft today, but Jerome Powell spoiled the party. Could it be Tesla and Netflix tomorrow? Who knows? Could it be Apple after the bell? Who knows? But we need one tailwind, a big one, and that will initiate a pop in the NASDAQ. Besides chips, pretty much everything is down. Even energy is down. The XOP is down big, over 1% today. Materials are down big. Retail, the XRT down big. But here's perhaps a clue to what's about to come. The upcoming rebound. Notice the contrast between growth and value. Growth is outperforming value. Is this a sign, an early sign that the NASDAQ is about to pop? Could be. Gold got crushed today, be it the GDX down big, even silver is down big. The SLV down big, the GLD, all of them are down. We're going to cover gold in the charts analysis. Now, when we look at international markets, the Brazilian ETF, once again, the EWZ outperforming along with European stocks. Moving on to charts, we start with a 30 minutes chart of the SPY, the S&P 500. It gapped higher in the morning, reaching the resistance at around 443. It couldn't make it. It tried over and over and over again. And then came Jerome Powell. The party spoiler. He pushed the SPY down. It stopped all the way at 430. And this is the good news. The SPY continues to hold on at 430. Once again, bottoming is a process. The chart has to continue to test these support lines over and over and over again until they're confirmed. Here's the bad news. If the SPY closes the day below 430 once again, then we have lower lows to come. And here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. S&P 500. It shot up higher in the morning, capturing the support of 4,384 and a half. And then once again came out Jerome Powell. And that support was lost. And we are now testing the lows of yesterday's candle. If we go down and retest the day before, Monday's lows, it's going to be an ominous signal. If we go down to 4,232, in all likelihood, it's not going to hold again. So the bulls better hope that Tesla and Netflix will open higher tomorrow. And oh, by the way, the earnings from Apple will come out pristine. Keyword, pristine. Because if that happens, remember that the stage is set for a rebound rally. The conditions are here. We have way oversold readings on the RSI and the MACD indicators. We're just waiting for a spark. Where is the spark? We thought it's going to be Microsoft, but then came Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell is gone now. We're not going to see him again till March. Where is the spark? Another encouraging sign for the bulls is the fact that the volume is receding by a little bit, yet it remains elevated. The bears remain in charge. The bulls need a spark. Where is the spark? And we're seeing calls right now from Goldman Sachs and City saying it is the time to buy the stock route. Are they going to be right or not? Who knows? But just a tip for you, these uh, analysts and strategists, all they do is look at the charts like you and I, and they see oversold readings on the RSI, the MACD. The risk versus reward says you want to consider buying the dip here as a trade. When that happens, the market rebounds, all of a sudden Goldman Sachs and City look like a bunch of geniuses. All what they're doing right now is just following the technicals just like you and I. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart, once again gapping higher, struggling to recapture 352. It tried over and over and over again, and finally it did until Jerome Powell started to speak. The good news is the Qs still holding at around 343 as support. If that is lost, then we're going to see lower lows. That's the bad news. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract on the Qs. The good news is the 14,000 remains support. If that is lost, watch out. There's more trouble ahead. And that is the bad news because the continuous contract went higher and recaptured 14,445 as support. And then it lost it all. We're now retesting the lows of yesterday's candle. If that retest has failed, we're going to go down and retest Monday's lows. By that time, boy, we have lower lows here. I doubt that the low for Monday will hold. The momentum indicators remain oversold, way oversold. And again, we're waiting for that spark. The volume is receding slightly. That's a good sign for the bulls. But it could come back again if we have a massive miss from Apple. What about the IWM, the Russell 2000 small caps from a 30 minutes perspective. Again, gapping higher, similar story, then consolidating for a little while until Jerome Powell spoke, and then it flushed all the way down till the end of the day, hugging the support of 196.5. That is the good news. It actually closed a little below that. We're not going to make a big deal out of it, but the line in the sand is 191.5. If the IWM 
loses 191 and a half as support, then abandon your longs and run for the hills because we have lower lows to come. The Dixie, the dollar index, what's going on here? The bull flag is playing out. Jerome Powell came out way hawkish than expectations. And to be honest, he wasn't really hawkish. He was just dazed and confused, stumbling all over the place falling in the traps that the reporters set for him by asking certain questions. Now that the uh, hedge funds, the insiders, the big shots are actually shorting the market now, they're holding puts, oh yeah, they want this market to go down. They already cashed out from the mania. Now they're betting that the market is going to go down. And the pop in the US dollar was not good for gold. Remember, gold has two enemies, the dollar and the US 10-year yield. It chose to ignore them for a little while, but now it is paying attention once again. Is it a one-day knee-jerk reaction? We'll see. But for now, what happened today is a bearish development for gold. Because number one, it did not go all the way to test the sloping line of resistance in yellow. Number two, it lost the support of the three amigos at around 1,835. The good news for gold is this. We saw the biggest daily inflow for the GLD in history. So we're seeing lots of buying here in gold. A lot of folks are sharing the same perspective that I have, that gold will be an ad performer in the second half of this year. And the reason is we're going to run out of pockets to buy. From the overvaluation in the stock market from commodities running too high, perhaps oil will lose its luster. And then what? With stocks down, cryptos down, money has to chase something. And if gold holds, it will be attractive, safe haven for money to chase. And what about the daily chart for the 10-year yield? And this is problematic, folks. We discussed two bearish scenarios yesterday. All of them are gone now. The bear flag, the head and shoulder, all gone. And we're now stuck with the bullish scenario. That we're going to make a higher high that could be at 1.94. And again, in my conditions for a bottom, the number one condition is the 10-year yield has to cool down. A massive pop like we saw today will put a pause in any relief rally, specifically in the NASDAQ, and the high multiple pockets in this stock market, regardless of the oversold conditions. There is only one scenario where the US 10-year yield moves higher along with the NASDAQ, and we discussed that in yesterday's video. That is if the outlook of growth improves because the Fed is more dovish than expectations. And that appeared to be the case at least earlier this day when the FOMC statement came out, but the conference by Powell canceled all of that. And in reality, it is the statement about the balance sheet that freaked out the market. What about a weekly chart for the TLT? Once again, the outlook remains the same. We're going down to 134 and a half. We continue to watch 140. If 140 is lost as support, then we're going down 134 and a half. If 140 holds and we see a rebound in the next couple of days and the 10 year cools down, then that could be a catalyst for the relief rally in the NASDAQ. Absent of that, it's really hard to see. The VIX, four hours chart, look at the MACD indicator, cooling off, producing red impressions on the histogram, yet it could curl its way higher and produce green impressions on the histogram once again, indicating that the pop in the VIX is not over. And therefore, you gotta watch this level, 33. If the VIX trades below 33, then it's all clear, it's all good for the SPY. If it climbs and reclaims 33 once again, forget about it, we have lower lows in the SPY, and the VIX will have higher highs. But to play the devil's advocate from the bullish side, what if this is an ABC pattern? We got the A leg, we're now forming the B leg, which will face resistance at around 33, and then we form the C leg perhaps all the way down to 20. That is the bullish outlook. The bearish outlook also consists of an ABC pattern, and it says that we've already seen the A leg and the B leg, and we're now forming the C leg higher to make higher highs. I'm leaning toward the bullish scenario, which means that we're going to see the C leg to the downside, yet it's really hard to make a high conviction call here after what we got today from the FOMC minutes, and most importantly, the conference by Jerome Powell. Moving on to the VXN 4 hours chart, once again, the MACD indicator is showing green impressions on the histogram. What does that mean? It's not over yet. The Qs did not bottom yet. It's only going to happen when the 4 hours MACD indicator on the VXN curls down, and the confirmation will be produced using red impressions on the histogram. Moving on to Apple, it ran a retest to the upper range of the channel 
and it got rejected right away. If the rejection continues, then we're going down all the way to 150. And of course, a critical day for Apple tomorrow. The momentum indicators are getting oversold, meaning all what Apple has to do is beat revenue and earnings expectations, the top and the bottom line, and then produce an upbeat guidance, which is really hard to do in this environment because the bar is too high now. To please the market, to initiate a rally in any stock, the bar just got a lot higher. Moving on to an hourly chart of Tesla. What's going on here? It almost ran a retest at 9.95, yet it reversed before doing so. This is not a good signal for Tesla. But again, we have earnings, and last time I checked, the stock is pretty much flat after hours. It will depend on the sentiment of the market tomorrow. If the sentiment is good, if the buyers are here, we will see Tesla moving higher and attempting to recapture 995 once again. If it doesn't and the negativity continues, we're going down to retest the same trend line in yellow that the chart has revisited on Monday. And doing so, by the way, is bearish in nature. It means it's not going to hold because you've already went down to retest that line and it produced a bounce. The bounce did not work. If the chart goes down or retest that line again, there is a high probability that the line will not provide support anymore. We're going to pierce below that line. And lastly, moving on to tulips, BTC, what's going on here? It is still consolidating, asking for buyers over and over and over again. The longer it consolidates, it's going to form a bear flag pattern and it's going to flush down all the way to 30,000. The candle doesn't look good. It is a reversal candle. And if the chart loses 35,750, it's going to be a massive flush down all the way to 30,000. And as cryptos go, so will the NASDAQ this time around. Notice how the reversals that we got on Monday and again today were led by cryptos. So use cryptos as a leading indicator to where the NASDAQ is going. There are no guarantees that the correlation will hold, but so far it has been accurate. The bad news for Bitcoin is the drawdowns are severe, but we've seen worse drawdowns before, meaning we could go a little lower. We could go down to 30,000 and then it becomes really oversold and it produces a bounce. There is still room to the downside, plenty of room here. And lastly, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the initial jobless claims and then the GDP, durable goods orders, and pending home sales. These are the important ones from tomorrow's activities in the economic calendar. Lastly, once again, the expectations for tomorrow. And the reminder of the week, it's a battle between the hawk and fundamentals, meaning corporate earnings. Corporate earnings, at least for now, are coming out good for the most part. Yet the market is ignoring all of that due to the concerns of number one, peak earnings, number two, the hawk, Jerome Powell. And the hawk has no other choice, by the way, to be even more hawkish. The question is, it's all about the sentiment now. Will the market sentiment say, you know what? We got one obstacle, a big one. The FOMC statement and the conference by Powell out of the way. And we can now concentrate on corporate earnings. If that is the sentiment tomorrow, then we could see the sell the rumor, buy the news phenomenon. Now that Jerome Powell is out of the way. The problem is, if the sentiment concentrates on the fact that Jerome Powell did not give a rat's ass about the recent declines in the stock market, then the sentiment for now is fixated on Jerome Powell and they're not going to pay attention to corporate earnings at all. They're not going to pay attention to the technicals and the oversold conditions that we have in the market right now. And if that is the case, then we have yet to see the bottom. And it's going to be way down there. Because if the market is looking for Jerome Powell to rescue them, well, he's not going to be here till March. He's not going to issue an emergency statement because the market is down another 10 to 15%. And this is what we've been talking about in this channel for so long. The market has no fundamentals to support these valuations besides the cocaine. Now that the cocaine is out, it doesn't matter what the fundamentals are. The market will continue to go down. So once again, the most important thing to watch out in the morning, right off the gate, is the market sentiment. And you will know that right away if Tesla and Netflix start trading in the red tomorrow. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.